Welcome to What's Under the Hood, a podcast about how the reactors that are um, available now and future reactors can help our society uh, and uh, uncover some of the um, mysticism or what, what people don't really understand and why they might want to change their mind about supporting nuclear energy. So today we have Colin Megson and Andrew Dawson. They're going to uh, start, I'm going to start with Andrew, uh, just talking about your background and a little bit how you got supportive of the BWRX, and um, and then uh, Colin can follow. I'm a little long in the tooth around some of this, in the sense that my bachelor's degree was in nuclear engineering from the University of Manchester over here. Um, so in that sense, I started around the sector in the age of 18, which, as you can probably see, is not recent. Um, I worked for a while on the AGRs, our own unique, very unique, um, British gas-cooled graphite moderated designs. And then, to be quite honest, our industry rather ran into the sand. So I spent about a 40-year career around in and around the energy sector, upstream oil and gas, downstream transmission and so on. Um, not necessarily deeply involved with the with the with the nuclear sector day to day, but always following it with a great deal of interest. Um, as to why I'm enthused by the BWRX, um, as will become apparent through the apparent through the conversation, as my wife puts it, I'm a cheapskate, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's an incredibly economical answer to an outstanding problem. Okay, yeah. That's good. I like that. Yeah, so that was a good... Yeah, so, uh, Carla, how about you? Yeah, well, uh, young, young Andy there. <laughs> Won't remember young, the thanks. Of, of using slide rules when you were designing nuclear reactors, I don't suppose, Andy. I wrote an awful lot of Fortran code between 1979 and 1986. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was... Uh, uh, I started uh, work... But I can use a slide rule. All right. <laughs> I started work um, as a pitter down a coal mine, and I had nine years at the, uh, the old National Coal Board, which was a nationalised UK industry, dealing with the, um, with the importance of the coal sector at that time. And during that time, I got some fairly reasonable qualifications and then moved into design engineering. And one of my first jobs was with Rolls-Royce and Associates in Derby, who are the, um, the nuclear reactor manufacturers for, um, for the new UK nuclear submarine fleet. So they've been manufacturing uh, small modular reactors for um, 60 years. I joined them in uh, 1965 and spent five years with them, but that was purely as a mechanical engineer. Uh, so I didn't have any uh, qualifications in nuclear engineering as such, other than some um, in-house training on the fundamentals of pressurized water reactors. So Now I know, Colin, why you're such a Rolls-Royce enthusiast. <laughs> Well, at that time, um, uh, even on the design engineering section, uh, we were designing a, a big rig to be based in Derby to, um, to test all the primary circuit, you know, the coolant pumps and the valves and everything else. And this, that uh, rig had to be designed to the ASME codes. And in those days, the ASME codes uh, were a series of books that were sort of eight inches thick that you, uh, that you had to refer to, going along with your slide rule and working through it all. I think there was one desk calculator in the whole office. And uh, th what there was... was her, what was her name? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was, uh, there was a little office with a mainframe in, well, a big office with a mainframe in, and people queuing up at the door with punch cards. Did you, see any oh, of the, did you ever see any of those, Andy? Um, I 
I, as a graduate trainee, I got landed the particularly delightful job of writing the finite element model for boiler supports for the abortive commercial fast reactor design. Mm. Uh, so I used to go in, produce my punch cards, of, you know, having turned this model into little triangles, transmit them over to Boeing, Cray, in Seattle, and then get back the following morning to find out why it had failed to run. <laughs> yeah, I know punch cards. <laughs> yeah, I just want to ask you both quickly about the, the um, your introduction to molten, um, not molten salt, uh, small modular reactors. I get those letters inverted. Yeah, how, how dare you? We'll get off on that topic later. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, my introduction was molten salt, really. Uh, it, it was uh, Kirk Sorensen back in around 2007 had a group, mm -hmm. and um, he did a series of uh, videos that uh, Gordon McDowell from Canada also um, helped put together. And to me, that was my exposure to small modular reactors, and specifically the the lifter, he called it, LFTR. Uh, has that um, – have you guys – been through those those videos too? Yeah. Um, Colin, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, well, I I, um, I retired in 2008, uh, and I was 70 at the time, uh, nothing much to do. And I, I started picking up on everything to do with wind turbines and solar panels and the need for reducing carbon, etc. And And I tripped over Kirk Sorensen, I did actually meet him a couple of times, uh, and I started mm -hmm. up a, a blog. I didn't know anything about blog or using computers at the time, and it was called Lifters to Power the Planet. <laughs> and that was in t that, that would have been about 2010, something like okay. that. Yeah. So I ran that blog for a few years, but um, uh, and I actually went down to uh, to the House of Commons two or three times to various meetings. There was a group formed called the um, All Party All Party APPG. What does that mean, Andy? All Party Parliamentary All Group. All Party Group. Yeah. APPG. All yeah. Party Parliamentary, Parliamentary Group. Parliamentary Group for uh, for thorium reactors. And Kirk Sorensen came a couple of times and gave a couple of presentations there. And I have the uh, the honour of um, being uh, called over by the uh, the um, Bishop of Durham to be asked if I'm Colin Megson. Uh, and you introduced me to lifters. It, it first time I heard it would have been on my blog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But very I short. Have to say. Sorry, go ahead, Colin. Well, I was going to say very shortly after that, I decided that lifters weren't going to go anywhere in my lifetime. <laughs> so I then moved on to um, Prisms to Power the UK. That was my next blog, and that was G attaches Prism Reactor. <laughs> yeah. And um, oh, what, 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 what is now called Natrium? That's right. Interesting yes, with exactly. a rebranding with a bit of heat, rebranding with a yeah. bit of heat storage on the yeah. side. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that was uh, <laughs> that was being seriously considered by the. Uh, the what they call it NDA, uh, National yeah. Decommissioning Authority, uh, for yeah. disposition of the uh, of the plutonium stockpile. Plutonium stockpile. Yeah. Yeah. To be honest, Colin, I still to this day cannot understand what led them to go elsewhere. Well, well not that they have gone no. elsewhere. They've just well, it's just kicked into the, in the middle. Yeah, it's kicked into the long grass. So I thought that's not going to happen in my lifetime as well. <laughs> <laughs> So now um, that's yes. why I'm onto the BWRX, and I I met uh, David Powell, who was a UK representative in 2018, and when I saw it, it blew my mind. I thought, you know, it's it, I use the phrase you can run past something and decide whether it's cost effective or not, and I thought there's nothing going to touch this, and I've been I've been uh, shouting in favour of the BWRX now for, since 2018. And that's when mm. I started a, the Facebook group. Started yeah, off. in my case, sorry, think. Colin. In my case, I got approached by a think tank pressure group over here called the then called the Global Warming Policy Foundation, mm. um, which are not necessarily the favourites of most of the uh, uh, climate change lobby. 
and they asked me to do an analysis on where the small mod the UK small modular reactor program had gone um, which was mainly disappearing up its own rear end thanks to the civil service mm. and that coincided just about with BWRX emerging mm. And much of the same way with Colin, I sort of looked at the thing and thought, hang on, this smacks of no-brainer. I mean, one thing just in the context of lifter and molten salt, um, I worked a bit, not a huge amount, on the sodium-cooled fast reactor program over here. I worked on AGR and had a, you know, through that had a lot of exposure to the horror stories of developing a new and novel technology. In that case, partly from scratch. Um, I had a lot of colleagues at the time who'd worked on our steam generating heavy water reactor, which was a straight rip off. Imagine nicking can do and turning it on end. That describes SGHWR rather well. Um, and so on. And I have to say, I'm very, very cautious about buying into completely novel reactor technologies. There's the wonderful quote, which I'm not going to try and quote verbatim from Rick Over about the difference between an academic and a practical reactor. Mm. And um, I'm afraid molten salt designs, terrestrial notwithstanding, who I will give credit for making progress, yeah. um, are very much at this stage in the academic uh, space, which means Ed File will come and hunt me down and dance on my grave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, just to get it started on this uh, BWRX 300, um, like I, I know that uh, General Electric is associated with uh, the project. Um, did it start that way? That's Colin, do yeah, you have well, an opinion I, on that? Yeah, BW, uh, I mean, the boiling water reactor, as far as I'm aware, was invent, more or less invented by uh, General Electric. It was. Yeah. It was, absolutely. And, um, I think the tidbit of information I remember from them is that uh, in, the, in 1980, they commissioned their 50th boiling water reactor mm. up and all around the planet. So that says, yeah. that says something for the credentials of the, of the people working in it. Oh, absolutely. General absolutely. Electric. Yeah. And I yeah. think if I they're... Mean, the, go on, Andy. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, if they're coming up with um, overnight capital costs in 2018, they, were, they had in print on their, um, on their data sheet a, a, an overnight capital cost of $2,000 per kilowatt. And then a, a couple of years later, it went up to 2,250 per kilowatt, right up to, yeah, right up to the... 2,600 at the moment, yeah. Yeah, well, I think right? it's... it's um, uh, they're not putting a price on at the moment. They're not putting any kind of cost on since all the energy issues and the price increases. But I've, I've been on the website and... Uh, uh, an American website to see what kind of increases can be expected in uh, on nuclear reactors, and it would take it up to from 2,250 per kilowatt up to two, about 2,500 per kilowatt. It's less than 12 percent the anticipated increase. I, I've seen numbers of 2,006, but uh, mm. 2,625 two, 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 sticks in my mind, but I can't recall where I saw it. Mm. So mm. please don't. You know, please don't ask me to die in a ditch over that. Um, they, yeah, I mean, as I understand the story, BWR's very, very iterative design. They started with things with external recirculation loops, which is very much the Fukushima designs. So you've got a pipe running out of the pressure vessel with a pump, and effectively some of the water flow bypasses the... the um, the turbines, comes back and you have water basically being recycled faster than purely it would be if it were going through the turbines. Then with ABWR, that got internalized. We got rid of the internal loops, external loops. 
And now, and then they produced a design early 2010s called the Economic and Simplified Boiling Water Reactor, ESBWR. And that was in itself quite spectacular in that it did away with any active coolant circulation whatsoever. Mm. It's purely a natural circulation design. BWRX is a scaled down and sim further simplified mm. version of ESBWR. Yeah. I wanted to tell you a little bit. I was telling Colin before you arrived that I had just finished interviewing someone that actually designed a reactor in the UK at one of his one of the schools there, and it's on paper still. It's patented, patented, and um, but he calls it a low pressure water reactor, and um, uh, I found that what he was explaining was pretty fascinating. That the idea that the um, there's no need for a, um, a, a a cooling pump. It, the, it, it uses the natural circulation. You kind of hinted at that just a minute ago uh, about um, not need, like using natural uh, forces. It, 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 was, it was a little more than a hint. That's the outstanding design feature of mm. ESBWR mm. inherited by BWRX. Okay. Now, is, now, tell me something. Now, he was referring to it almost like a siphon effect. Like the, if you go yeah. down far enough in the that's, ground, you get this. That's precise. Doesn't yep. even need to be particularly low in the ground. You've got, provided you've got even a fifty degree temperature differential from top to bottom mm -hmm. of the core, you can drive natural circulation if you design it well. Okay. Especially if you allow boiling, because of course that means the top end is at very low density relative to the lower end. Mm. And maybe you could explain how that, like, for, I wanted to. Um, I wanted us to have this sort of uh, notion that we're excited about this reactor, that it's a, uh, we want to brag a little bit of what it can do. So, for example, how much, how will it save on costs? Is that a, is that a big cost saver, this pump? No, oh, no steam generators, no pumps, no backups for any of those devices. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Secondarily, and again, we'll get onto this later, I'm sure, because it was one of the questions on your sheet. In terms of post-accident issues, which is what, you know, unfortunately, we tend to get driven by cost on, they've come up with something quite outstanding. Both the reactor pressure vessel and the containment have devices called an isolation condenser. Now, that is effectively a welded-in heat exchanger on the wall of the RPV and on the wall of the, the, um, on the, wall of the containment. Separately, they feed heat exchangers sitting in a tank of water above the top head of the reactor. Now, you want that tank of water anyway, because it's what you use when you're manoeuvring fuel about during refueling. Now, what they will allow is boiling in that circuit, that in either circuit, RPV or containment, obviously steam rises above water, goes up into this relatively cool water tank sitting above the above the reactor, causes local boiling. That's allowed to vent to atmosphere, but, hey, it's just steam. What's the issue? Um, and then the condensed water falls back down to continue the circuit. So it's a self-powered heat removal mechanism post-shutdown. And I believe, Colin, correct me again if I'm wrong, they've gone for seven-day a minimum capacity of seven, in minimum above of reactor seven water days. tank. Yeah, yeah. But rea actually, if you've got mains pressure on your water supply on site, all you need is a tap. Yeah. <laughs> to keep that tank back, yeah. back, backed up. Well, I, I, I think that was the lessons learned at uh, Fukushima. Uh, actually, all the roads... No, no the, main, the main lesson learned at Fukushima is not let the Japanese Prime Minister anywhere near a decision on venting. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, but the thing was that they ended up uh, rushing in uh, fire tenders and pumping seawater into, uh, into the cooling ponds and anywhere else they could try to get co yeah. keep cool. Uh, whereas now, uh, I think within that seven days, if you've got roads or, you know, even if your water supply, you can get, any, yeah. you can get anything there in time to, do, to just do the same, keep the water topped up. Yeah. And the water is not in contact with any 
contaminated part of the circuit. That's the key point. Exactly. It's literally just yeah. a heat removal mechanism. Yeah, yeah. I see. Right. Now, the um, the amount of water that goes through, uh, I was surprised at how many um, tons of water per, I don't know, second. Like, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, that kind of rate uh, of water passage uh, is not a natural. It's, it's the fission that does it, right? Well, it, the fission provides the heat that drives the circulation. Okay, yeah. And, yeah, uh, but can, circulation is a, is enabled by natural uh, forces. Absolutely, yeah, mm. absolutely. And it's an interesting it's an interesting comment, I, Colin. I don't know if you. I know I've commented this a couple of times on various channels, and you've actually it's not something. It's one of the very few things on which you've never replied. But one of the interesting aspects of this is none of this designed for passivity. There's not only present in BWRX, it's designs like the AP-1000, it's the incremental heat removal circuit that's going on in the Russian and Chinese designs mm. and so mm. on. It's all down, and here's the weird thing, to computer modelling, having the technology to do large-scale thermal hydraulic mm. computer mm. modelling. Yeah, yeah. And that is in itself revolutionary. We don't need to build multiple generations of experimental rigs to prove that any given design works. We now really can say, oh, look, stuck in the containment, there's that heat exchanger with this surface area operating at this mm. pressure, blah, 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 X metres above it, sitting in a water tank is another heat exchanger. Will coolant fluid naturally flow mm. between the mm. two as single phase or mm. two phase? That is revolutionary, and it's a, such an yeah. odd thing to have revolutionised reactor design. Mm -hmm. am, am I correct in thinking that there's a molten salt version that uh, used computer modelling to prove that uh, they could get the natural circulation? Uh, is it the I, is it I, molten I'd be, uh, molten? I'd be amazed, Colin, if there was any molten salt design out there now that's not using at least part of these mm. methods to design hey, how cheap is it to build a model in a computer mm. compared to actually going and building a rig? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, it just makes you... Let me just give you a little story that will illustrate the difference. Um, when I did my undergraduate degree, we had to do a project, a thesis, and so on. And my, the company I was ultimately went to work for, that I was sort of semi-sponsored by by this stage, asked me to do a demonstration rig about how you'd get water back over a cooling rod in a dried out PWR. Now, nowadays, like I say, you just sit down and you code, you wouldn't even code the thing. You'd actually write the model. Yeah. Mm. You just show what shape it is. Everything else will be taken care of. As it was, we spent three months building this damn thing. I ended up stoned out of my head on one occasion on acetone fumes from cleaning it and little <laughs> other things like that. My girlfriend at the time wasn't impressed. <laughs> and when we ran it for the first time, we sh we blew the buzzer bars for the uh, three megawatt supply for the engineering department <laughs> when we managed to send a jet of water, mixed water and steam above them, five metres above the rig. Mm. Now, compare that. You know, this is why we can come up now with innovative designs. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm going off down a blind alley and an enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating stuff, and it makes me wonder about um, about this idea that, uh, like a lot of this, a lot of people watching would be wondering, what is the moderator? And I like because the, they've been yeah, introduced right. to reactors from the concept of there's a moderator, but I think in this case, it's the water is the only yeah, moderator. It's, it's, ju it's just a BWR, water cold, water moderated. Yeah. yeah. The only difference with a PWR is that the water's allowed to boil. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, that's another quite important safety feature, which is sometimes missed, and actually is a BWR advantage. Obviously, if you allow boiling in the core, wherever the boiling is taking place, there's less moderation. Yeah? Because there's less water. Mm. It's steam. It's yeah. less dense. Mm. Okay, yeah. That reduces power. 
the more boiling takes place, if the reactor gets hotter, more boiling takes place, more voiding takes place, less moderation takes mm. place, power reduces. Yeah. So it's inherently still self-stabilizing mm. in that mm. thing. Dry the damn thing out and you have no you have no chain reaction going on whatsoever. Mm. Mm. Do you say that, th that there's no uh, no generator? No. Sorry, no, no, sorry, I think you misunderstood that. There's no steam generator. No steam? Literally, what? Literally, the water boils mm -hmm. for two reasons. It boils in contact with the cladding on the fuel rods, ordinary classic nuclear boiling little bubbles. Yeah. And a fair, I'd, I'd need to see the details of this. I don't honestly know the detail. A fair amount of heating will take place because in the process of moderation, mm -hmm. you dump energy into the water. All those little neutrons zapping around, mm. bouncing off the hydrogen atoms... Mm -hmm. They are dumping heat with every every collision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So yeah, um, it's a thing that's it's a thing that's somewhat underestimated about what both PWR and BWR. They do have this characteristic. They will self shut down if you allow too much boiling. Mm -hmm. Too much boiling in the case of a BWR. Any boiling in the case of a PWR. Is there any kind of um uh, design in, in, uh, regarding whether you use wet steam or dry steam uh, and keeping them separated? It's too... Um, it, BWR is just, of any sort, including BWRX, is just not hot enough to produce dry steam. I see. And that's the reason... I mean, I, t I looked up the numbers just to be sure, just before coming on this. BW, BWRX pressure vessel is an unusual beast. It's only four meters across. It's six. Me it's six or eight meters high. No, that's not right. It's twenty-four meters yeah, high. Yeah. It's a tall, narrow thing. Now, part of that is for the chimney effect that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. But the top third of that is occupied by a steam dryer, a mechanical device that makes the steam go through lots and lots of little turns and lose any water droplets in the process. I get it. I'm not sure that Colin approves of this from previous encounters, but one of the things I, the one of the ways I like to describe BWRX, do you know the history of the Liberty ships in World War Two? Yeah. Yeah, he and I will both point this out. This was a British concept of a simple, standardised merchant vessel to replace submarine losses, losses to submarines, and so on. The US took the design over and, frankly, massively improved the production process. And I think the record in the end was they built a complete merchant vessel in 42 days. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that is... That's big for those days. <laughs> it's probably, well, it's probably even more amazing for now. Mm. Um, <laughs> they did radical things. They introduced new technologies. They made an all-welded hull because riveting it took too long. Mm. Uh -huh. Yeah. But one of the key enablers was they got rid of the steam turbine, which had been standard for large vessels since Parsons and Tabinia and whatever, 1890, and replaced it with an old-style steam engine-type reciprocating engine, hmm. which was appallingly inefficient, and it made they were slow. But you know what? They were cheap, and you could churn them out in the hundreds. Mm. Now, one of my enthusiasm for BWRX is BWRX that has the potential to be the liberty ship of yeah. nuclear reactors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And it will need to be if we're no, to do anything. Absolutely. Bloody loot, Nicole. Yeah, Sorry, I don't yeah. know if that's allowed on your side of the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, uh, the, the one thing that makes me uh, curious, uh, you said um, that like, a, like an old-fashioned steam engine, well... What about the idea that um, most of the components could be off the shelf? Is that possible? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. Well, it might have to be a special shelf, but yeah. literally, if you get the production volume going, that's when you start not building to order. That's when the economies of scale really kick in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. For example, the fuel itself, um, the, you have uh, control rods. Am I right or not? 
No, the, f- the fuel is absolutely bog-standard ABWR fuel that's running, I think, Colin, you've got 60-some-odd reactors globally. Yeah. yeah. And, and that also has a key thing in terms of licensing because the fuel and the fuel manufacturing process is already licensed, clear in a way. AB, um, here in the UK, not that the project ultimately went ahead, but we have licensed the ABWR design, the Advanced Boiling Water Reactor Design from Hitachi, mm. which is a licensee of GE, a partner of GE. Mm-hmm. That fuel has passed all the licensing things necessary, licensing issues necessary for UK build. Therefore, that does not happen, have to happen again in building a BWR here, mm. BWRX here. Mm. So this uh, KISS um, was heavily influenced by over-regulation, I'd say. Uh, we had the regulatory issues that caused people to say, well, how can we impress the regulator and make our reactors safer? Every country's industry has done the same. Yeah. And the most extreme example is the EPR. They've just layered extra levels of redundancy mm-hmm. on AP AP thousand was the first real attempt to break away from that, and frankly, Westinghouse. Again, I don't know if this expression is allowed on your side of the Atlantic, but cocked it up by going into building Votel, going into building Sumner with an underdeveloped design and inexperienced contractors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, actually. It's easier to convince a a regulator by stripping out but replacing with natural inherent forces, hence passivization. Not even the NRC, not even our ONR is going to say, well, prove to me that less dense fluid rises above heavier. Actually, no, please, no, no, I shouldn't have said that. They'll now take that as a challenge. (laughs) Yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, good. This is turning yeah. into the Andy Dawson show, is this? I'm sorry, Colin. No, I'll shut no, up. No, it, no, it's, no it's, you're it's doing very well. It's a sat down comedian in you. <laughs> well, you, you haven't heard, you know, there's a couple of lines planned for later. You'll like those. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so the BWRX uh, will need to be made in tens of thousands before the end of this century for us to stand any chance, and it's the only chance we've got, really, of doing anything uh, in relation to net zero, whether um, you're a, a net zero yeah. enthusiast or not. I'm, not. I'm not sure I quite buy the same numbers, but certainly an order of mag- orders of magnitude more than we've seen anything else mm-hmm. so far. Yeah, I was... Uh, I was- Fascinated by the, what you said about Wilfa. I know this wasn't during our conversation, but you had it in the notes that Wilfa has parallel reactors planned. Well, this is all a little mysterious at the moment um, because at the moment Wilfa is owned by Hitachi. The site is owned by Hitachi. Right. We're obviously in bed with GE, and ultimately BWRX is a GE Hitachi design. Mm-hmm. Um, but numbers are being banded around. Colin, I think you were the one who quoted this four and a half gigawatt number that somebody was talking about, and you run that through the um, you run that through the mill, and that's sixteen, yeah, yeah, sixteen three hundred megawatt units. Mm-hmm. Now, Wilf has a damn big site, mm. so and BWRX has an amazingly small footprint, so mm. it would fit. Mm. Mm. But that's a hell of a lot on one side. I think um, there was some concern about the transmission that was available from that site, though, wasn't there? There would, yeah. there would be. Yeah. 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 Um, but then again, we have an interesting situation over here, Rick, where our grid operator basically hates nuclear. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. They, they, they have a funding formula that sets the price they can charge per megawatt hour. Mm-hmm. But that price and the profit level they're allowed on it is related to the number of kilometres of cable they run. 
Yeah. So the funny thing is, a vastly bigger grid to connect, connect lots and lots of renewable, intermittent renewables mm. in remote areas looks really, really good to national grid shareholders. Yeah. And one of it looks their... absolutely terrible to everybody else. <laughs> and one of their prime uh, scenarios is no, no more nuclear after Hinkley. I think. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, right or wrong, is it, is it the issue of um, not being able to ramp up and down uh, nuclear? Why they don't like it? No, they want lots more cables. More cables, oh. yeah. They're allowed to make an annual profit based on a rate of return on the amount of money they've got tied up in cables. Mm. Oh, my goodness. So their profit figure gets bigger the bigger the grid gets. Mm. Wow. Every offshore, cool, every offshore wind farm. If we could find most regulatory models ultimately come down to this rate of return. Mm. Sounds like Franz Kafka. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just more complicated for money. You, 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 met, you met some of our energy ministers now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But, there's, there's, quite a few, there's quite a few human cockroaches amongst them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So but, every, um, every offshore wind farm that uh, the national grid can connect up is money in the bank for them. So, absolutely. Yeah. And the best part is, Colin, the offshore connections aren't even part of their regulated base. Oh. <laughs> they can charge what they damn well want. Yeah, yeah. Hey. Uh, Money for the boys. Yeah. So, as you know, I'm I'm from Canada, and you know that the yeah. first first BWRX um, is going to be in Toronto or close to Toronto in oh, uh, Arlington. Yeah. Arlington. Yeah. And um, uh, and there's a projected date. I believe it was 2028. Um, yeah. And then yeah. I think. Please, please, please don't cock it up. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And what about, okay, so Tennessee has one planned, yeah. um, mm -hmm. somewhere close to that same schedule, probably later. And uh, and now Poland, I just heard today, has specified the, the cities and the regions where they're going to build them. Oh. And that was fascinating. I saw that as a, um, it came up on one of my, I think it was on Twitter. And, um, and now they know what sites they want, which is pretty fascinating. And do you remember how many sites there are going to be in Poland? Well, I, I think, God, okay, I yeah, it, go, was, go, uh, go, it was uh, a company called Orlen um, and owned by a billionaire called Michael Solowow. Uh, and they planned right from the beginning, they planned to order 10 BWRX. Uh, oh. And then he joined up with another billionaire. I can't remember the name of his company, but now the total stands at 16. And I think between the two, the two uh, groups of companies, uh, they've started establishing, or they were searching around for sites, and I wasn't aware that they'd actually named some. But you, you seem to be implying, Rick, then they've actually named some sites now, have they? Yeah, they've got the actual cities uh, in the article I saw, yeah. Oh, right, okay. okay I'll take a look for that. All we, need, all we need, Colin, is Jim Ratcliffe to come on board. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well... In this country, I would have uh, I would have put my money on uh, Lord Bamford and his son Joe Bamford, because Lord Bamford now is going into production on uh, hydrogen internal combustion yeah, engines. <laughs> we're never going to agree on that one. <laughs> we are. You're going to have to concede, Andy. At some stage, you're just going to have to pack it in. So he's building internal yeah. combustion engines. And his son is uh, building fleets of buses, and they'll eventually uh, hydrogen-powered busher, buses, and they'll eventually be powered by internal combustion engines. Mm. But um, I, I, I'm sure I've put enough information up about the new scale uh, activities on what they say they can do in respect of uh, using. You, you, you mentioned it once or twice. Once or twice, yeah. <laughs> well, if it if it comes out at that, it it works out at about. Um, uh, $2 per kilo for the hydrogen, and in the States, at the put so that's factory price gate, uh, factory gate mm. price, uh, and at the pumps it's uh, the same energy uh, in diesel or kerosene would cost you about $5. So you haven't very much of a gap, so I think there would have to be some subsidy there. 
uh, until they get down to um, to Joe Biden's uh, one dollar per kilo. And I don't know how the hell they're going to do that, but that <laughs> that's what he's hoping for. Yeah, well, we'll stay we'll stay off that subject for the sake of American <laughs> listeners. I just wanted maybe, to... maybe for the American listeners, we should go into it. And then... <laughs> I wanted to read something I read uh, from a book by uh, Colin Tucker about, uh, I believe it was called Driving, How to Drive a, a Nuclear Reactor. He's from the UK. And um, mm -hmm. he says, if you're driving a modern PWR at steady output, you'll have as much power at your fingertips as 40 fully laden 747 aircraft taking off simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, yeah. 40 fully laden, yeah, so that's that sounds immense. And I'm wondering, like, is that that's based on a, probably a one, a one gigawatt reactor kind of, right? If he's a reactor operator from the UK running a PWR, I can tell you how exactly how much it is. It's 1,200 megawatts, his size mm. will be. Mm. Oh, okay, yeah. and That's uh, our own PWR here. The only one. <laughs> so, so I guess you, if you wanted to figure out... Um, uh, you know, they're saying that that would re that would be forty. So if you take a, um, a BWRX, uh, three hundred, divide it yep. by uh, three, I, I guess by four, by four, by yeah. four, it's about ten jumbo jets. Mm. Mm. Okay, but it's still amazing. Uh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah. well, and, it, uh, the idea is the operator has that at their fingertips. So, so tell me something about whether or not. There is when they say at your fingertips, that doesn't mean you have the the will to turn up or turn down. National Grid might have something to say about it if you mm. suddenly turned up from six hundred <laughs> megawatts to twelve hundred. You know that that might have consequences elsewhere. <laughs> right, right. Well, it, it uh, that that's a quite a necessary situation at the moment when you've mm -hmm. got uh, I don't know we've got thirty gigawatts of wind. Uh, no, is it about 15 gigawatts of wind online? No, Colin, oh. we've got 25 gigawatts of wind and 14 of solar, and it's effing terrifying. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but dropping six, dropping six gigawatts is nothing in the space of a, a few hours uh, when it comes to no, wind absolutely. power. absolutely. Yeah, so you've got to have the capacity to load follow uh, a sudden six well, gigawatt. Alternatively, we just underbid the wind components. Oh, well... well Oh, the Which reason, thing, oh, another another oh, interesting question, since we're talking about load following, uh, some people talk about if you have several reactors, like we were talking about that Wilfa might have, if you wanted to, you could run them all at, at uh, a little bit below full capacity and then um, switch up to full capacity when it's needed. Does that sound like a feasible plan? Welcome to France. Mm. Okay. <laughs> So France does that. Okay, but, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's a terrible... It, it, to be fair, it doesn't... Sorry, Colin, go. Yeah, I was going to say, it's a terrible use of a, a nuclear reactor's capability to wind it up and down as if you're driving a car. I mean, it's okay yeah. if you're powering a submarine, but uh, not if you want in if you want in 100% availability uh, of the power from that reactor. But, of course, the answer is couple it up to an electrolyzer a PEM electrolyzer, and you can load follow in milliseconds while the yeah. while the reactor yeah. is running at one hundred percent availability. Yeah. Alternatively, you just have a few million EVs hooked up on the system, and you control their charging, and you get rid of most of the day night variation anyway. You might have gathered, Rick, Colin, and I have crossed swords on this before. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but if, where does that few million EVs come from? Yeah, exactly. Um, by the giving... fact we're banning selling the anything else by 2035. <laughs> have, you been have you been watching Mark Mills at all, either of you gentlemen? No. Mark P. Mills? Oh, well, just put in, what, what does he call it? Uh, yeah. Energy transition. If you put in energy transition yeah. on YouTube and listen to Mark Mills. Okay. He, uh, what about, yeah, okay, what yeah, about yeah. Simon Michaud? Have you been watching him, Andy? That doesn't ring a bell. Simon no. Michel, I've, seen, oh, well, I've seen that name, yeah. Put him in on YouTube. He's telling you all why the energy transition is... Not, both of them are saying the energy transition will just falter 
and come to a grinding halt on the basis of the minerals required. Um, oh, sorry, yes, that's Mish now, isn't it? Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I've never been formally taught economics. I only picked it up as sort of part of a later business degree, but resource elasticity does tend to be pretty damn remarkable. And things like, well, you know, well, let's not go there. I'm sure that's not the subject. For the, this is not exactly about BWRX. This thing. No, no. <laughs> yeah, no. it started getting sidetracked. But, um, yeah, uh, so um, we're talking about th whether it's ideal or whether it's a uh, strain to make a BWRX um, being able to throttle the power. Um, they, they do it a bit to a degree, any BWR does. Yeah. Because if you demand extra power for it, you open up the regulator, more steam goes out, reactor pressure, vessel pressure, pressure drops, the water boils a bit more, the column, the steam and water column extends further up the fuel, you, get more, you automatically get a balance to more power output. It's a really nice characteristic of BWRs, which I understand terrified the operators of the first generation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but it's, yeah, it's, like somebody gave an example talking about the tea drinkers um, when you're trying to balance the grid and then the, uh, something happens on the television, people go boil yeah. their kettles and um, it all happens around the same time of day and suddenly puts a strain on the system. Yeah, don't... Don't overestimate how big those short-term spikes are. We're talking 3 to 5% of demand. We're not talking the big shift. The big shift in the UK is night to day. Okay, sure. So midnight, we'll be burning about 23 gigawatts. Middle of the day, or 5 p.m., we'll be burning about 40. We'll average about 37, 38. Yeah? In, uh... Now... Okay, go on. So, FA Cup or whatever sporting event finishes, um, you might get a couple of extra gigawatts of demand, but it's nothing compared to the actual, what they call the diurnal shift. Okay, sure. Yeah, but uh, th and there's no way a, a nuclear power plant could react over that uh, period of time that the cups of tea are needed. So it's, no, it's that, pretty, and that's absolutely true. It's pretty that's useless. absolutely true. And it's that's, useless for low yeah. Yeah, but we well no, they're good for load following on the day to night scale. Mm. Oh yeah. BWRL BWRX quotes fifty to hundred percent cycling per day and half a percent per minute. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. Now that's not you know, the economics is a different issue, Colin, and I know again we've had that mm. conversation many times. Um but the um actual physical ability to load follow is there to a degree. Now, the short-term spiking, frankly, my I'm, I'm, I'm old school. You know, my, I trained partly with the CEGB back in the early 80s. And my perspective tends to be, well, that's what, for, that's what pump storage is for. God. If you were like an en energy minister, who would, you want to, who would you want to pair up with to provide that? Like, I, ideally, you probably would want a different kind of reactor, right? No, no. I'd be very happy with BWRX combined with things like the load management on EVs and this sort of electric mm. heating, heat pumps and such we're likely to be moving to. Don't you comment. Well, I, I will because it's, it's, you're, you're into magical thinking now. Magical thinking <laughs> is what Mark Mills talks about because there's no way you're going to control the, uh, the demand side on electrical vehicles. Power in electrical vehicles. You're going to People... take out. You're going to take out. You're not going to take it out short term, Colin. That's true. But you are going to take out the vast majority of the diurnal shift. My wife has an EV. Mm -hmm. She already has it on a deal where the charging can be postponed for up to a few hours mm. remotely by the system operator. Mm. Mm. Interesting. It's doable. It's only, I mean, it's right back to the sixties, Colin. Christ, again. Yours and mine sort of era, ripple controllers in storage heaters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well... Yeah. Uh, the, the, it's, no more techno it's no higher tech than that. No, but the, the thing is about um, using uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen manufacture uh, through these P 
PEM electrolyzers is the electrolyzer power plants are really low cost, down to sort of $300 per kilowatt. Although over the lifespan of a nuclear power plant, you might need five of them. So it bumps your, mm. it bumps your cost up by, say, $1,500 per kilowatt. But you add that to 2,650 per kilowatt, and what you've got is then is a, an electric is, is a nuclear power plant that produces 100% availability day in day out for 60 years at full power. Do you know what I'll? Do you know what I really need to go and do? And they probably have to wait till summer vacation now. I really need to go and build some models on this. Yeah, well, yeah, well, the, well yeah. the thing is, Andy, the, the economic side of it is that in the UK, an operator of a, 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 a unit comprising of um, a, a BWRX, let's say, or a Rolls-Royce small modular reactor, and, uh, and the, full range, the, the full capacity of uh, electrolyzers, it will get uh, full price... When he wants the full price for the grid electricity, he'll get, um, when he's producing green hydrogen to follow wind or solar, to load follow wind or solar, he'll get the price for the green hydrogen production. He'll get, a pri he'll get a, 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 an income from uh, load following grid service and he'll get an income from frequency correction grid service. And you don't need mm. one iota of stored stored energy of any kind in that situation. Mm, I'm not well. Again, let me go and try and build some models about the effect mm. on uh, as the effect of cost on the shifts you might be able to get in capacity factor. Mm. Yeah. But um, yeah, I'm like I said, I'm old school. I think it's far easier to a follow to a degree load follow and then to um, Pending that to actually load manage, but hey. And yeah. you're saying that the that the um, grid operator wants more cables or power cables? Is that what yeah. you're saying? And it's in, uh, you will never ever get them to say that, but that is inherent <laughs> in the pricing model from the regulator. No, mm. what about okay? So you know who also wants that is the um, the, the wind and solar. They're talking about distributed power, right? Yeah, um, oh, quite. And let's put let's put it this way: It's twelve years ago now. I once came very close to getting thrown out of a conference in London for uh, pointing out to the operations director of National Grid that actually this is you know this would be money for old rope for you because it would push your grid utilisation up without changing your capital model and so on. And he just turned around to me and said, "Oh." Somebody spotted that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah, well, put it this way. My boss, who was sitting next to me, was not impressed. <laughs> National Grid was a major customer. <laughs> oh, boy. Mm. Um, sweep it under the... I've done a few of those over mm. the years. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, yeah, just to, to get back a little bit about the design itself. Um, so... Let's talk a little bit about the safety, the passive safety. Mm -hmm. um, what What is passive about the, the BWRX 300 then? Do you want to go, Colin? Uh, well, it is the, the natural circulation and the fact that Absolutely. they've got these uh, isolation condensers in place so that uh, for a seven-day period, um, if, the, if the reactor is scrammed or loses all power, it can keep the, uh, the, the reactor cooled uh, just by this um, boiling off the, the water in the, um, in the reservoir. Um, yeah. So that gives time for any kind of emergency service. There should be on-site services too that you can just couple up to be able to uh, top, the, top the, um, the cooling water up. But how, uh, do you, um, how do you account for the um, quantity of water having to remain cool? Like, you need a large It's plant. not, it's yeah, not well, that big. No? I mean, the, the, what, what tends to fool people, and this is an interesting example from Fukushima, admittedly now 10 years old, they're still cooling three cores, melted down there. 
How much in terms of domestic hose pipes? How many do you? How many hose pipes worth of water do you think they're using? Oh, that's interesting. Well, it, yeah. Well, it's uh, it's twelve years now, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's so, about, so well the, for the last five years. It's been about two per reactor. Two per reactor. Yeah, yeah. Because um, the short-lived um, fission products must be cooling off at, at, at a great rate. By everything, well, the, everything bar cesium and strontium's gone. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the uh, yeah no the quite, heat, quite seriously the numbers sorry the numbers look quite good but as soon as you allow that that you know um, a, a perfectly ordinary domestic hose pipe can supply tens of liters a minute mm, mm, yeah it actually doesn't look that big at all no no and in particular in particular if you allow it to boil that quantity of water can remove a huge amount of heat. Mm. Uh -huh. Yeah. When is when does how long does it take before it's available as a coolant again? Because it goes back into the condenser. It isn't. It'll boil away. No, it it'll go into the atmosphere. Yeah. Oh, I see. Oh. Sooner or later, sooner or later, it'll rain. <laughs> okay. So, um, like uh, in France, I think we, I think you might have seen that. I mentioned the the France situation yeah. where the the local water supply becomes so so hot that it, it they have to shut down the reactors. Um, and that's because they're in rivers that uh, don't have uh, quick access to the ocean, I suppose. And, um, yep. yeah. Look, look, you're Canadian, we're British. Yeah. What would we give for that climate mm. <laughs> <laughs> to have our rivers getting that warm? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good, good answer. So <laughs> give, a slightly, give a slightly more serious answer. Yeah. All the, French, all the inland French plants use old-style wet cooling towers where mm. basically you're boiling, you're evaporating water mm. to get rid of heat during full-scale operation. Um, modern designs, hybrid and such, use a fraction of the amount. And you can, if you want, go to a fully dry system mm. that doesn't require external water at all, that just deep dumps heat to atmosphere. Mm. It's a bit more expensive and it does cost you a couple of points of efficiency mm. because it's perhaps, harder to dump. Perhaps more wear and tear on the units too? No, but not really affected. Oh, really? Interesting. I, I think I've seen an artist's impression of the BWRX with the air cooling. Um, yeah, I've certainly seen them with the hybrid, which is the fan-driven mm. condenser. Yeah. But they're still partly wet. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I don't. I don't I think, honestly I think know. that's the one I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But again, for, for, from the UK perspective, the only inland nuclear plant we've ever operated sat on a gra damn great lake, mm. Trosfenneth in Wales. All oh, right. My father used to go fishing there because the ta the trout were fatter because it was warmer. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you could maybe you could explain about stability um, and what what makes a BWRX stable. Exactly the same as any other light water reactor. Yeah. Plus the fact you have this self-regulation mechanism with the, the height of the steam water column. Mm. Okay. Um, what is that? Yeah. I don't know. I'd have to go and look what at the exact it? numbers. But the, you I think it's 26 about metres. To, yeah, that's the whole pressure oh, vessel. Whole pressure vessel. This would be about how much of the core is submerged at any given time oh. and how much of it is in the sort of bubbly steam mm. column. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Because I was kind of fascinated when I was talking to this um, other person about the low pressure reactor, water reactor. Um, he um, was able to determine that um, 100 meters down was um, using <laughs> using records from other schools, like like where you do the research. And you were saying that these days you can get an awful lot of information from um, research other people have done, uh, yes. saving you the um, having to plant the figures in yourself and get them. Well, there's the interesting thought. If he's got a 100-metre column of water above the reactor, uh, rho GH, uh, 1,000 kilos times 100 times 10. He's got 10 bar. He's, is that right? Is that, I'd have to check it. He's got 10 bars of pressure. Somewhere just between, from the height of the water column. I do remember him saying between 5 and 10, somewhere in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that would be, 
you know, that would effectively be self-pressurizing. But the problem you've got in anything inherent, Colin, uh, sorry, uh, Rick, the lower the pressure you have in the, in the vessel, in the steam circuit, the cooler the temperature and the lower efficiency you have at the turbine. Yeah. That's the first thing that springs to mind when he talks about the low pressure reactor is low pressure, low temperature, low efficiency. Oh, they all Quiet. go hand in hand. You know, know what he did say? Is that he said that his design would require twice the amount of fuel because um, that means that you would still deal with... Uh, I'd be surprised if it was that low, frankly. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so, that, the, yeah, that's interesting. So the extra fuel would be because you're... Um, I guess because you need more to create that energy that's... Yeah. 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 Well, I wouldn't well, dwell I on it because it's... also assuming a very high burn-up of that fuel. Mm -hmm. But he said since it's cheap, uh, that it's worth the, worth the exchange, yeah. in his opinion, was anyway. And he's actually got a very good point there. Because mm -hmm. this was one of the huge mistakes the UK made on the AGR program. Mm -hmm. The AGRs were predicated on two ideas... One, that uranium would become expensive and therefore higher efficiency, higher thermal efficiency by running hot mm. would be a plus. As it was, it's turned out to be an unutterable pain in the backside mm. because of corrosion at the top end of the reactors. And again, I was polite. You could broadcast that. <laughs> um, but the other thing was AGRs were supposed to be able to refuel online and it doesn't turn out to be a good idea. Mm. Which brings me back to something you mentioned earlier. Parallel reactors allow you to turn one or two of them off to refuel them, right? Yeah. And uh, you but then again, provided, provided you've got grid connections, it doesn't really matter where any one reactor is, provided your total input to the system is the same, you could. This is the question where I was having a uh, um, quizzing on calling on or before you'd arrived about the difference between series and parallel. We talk about batteries being in series and parallel, right? Is, is, there, yeah. is there a similarity to the way they set up a, um, a series of BWR reactors? Not that I can think of, Colin. I guess what I'm saying is, like, when you do need to keep no, maintain the same voltage, uh, you want, no, like, you could theoretically pull some off, and it would, the voltage would remain the same. No, it's no, not. You, I, I was, just, no, uh, I was just discussing the terminology, really. Nothing oh, okay, to do yeah, with how you would you wouldn't yeah. uh, consider... The same kind of electrical connection of uh, okay, series yeah. and parallel for real. Everything go. Everything goes to the grid at the same voltage. Mm, yeah, you just don't really have that option. Mm. Right. So, but so by shutting down two out of twelve, that would alter. That's great. That would alter by two a factor of two. Um, uh, that much voltage it goes to the grid. No. no, it will change the amperage you put into the grid. Okay. You're generating less power in total. Mm. But you must still, for example, to go into the UK supergrid, you must still provide voltage at 400 kV. I see. Mm. Okay. And if you don't, if you don't, again, they get really upset with you. Mm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So these are important distinctions, and uh, not all of us, like laymen like myself, doesn't really get a full grasp on the difference between amperage and voltage. And, um, but... Um, well, yeah, yeah you, you don't really it's need to concern no. yourself about that. Uh, it, w what we're talking about is, in series and parallel is the actual building program. Yeah. So yes. you, you can build reactors side by side all at the same time, as many yeah. as you want, if you've got the or you can commercial build them spaced out. Or you can build them spaced out, yeah. And I guess I yeah. want to be clear on whether the advantage of uh, refueling is really there when you ha have so many in parallel. It, actually, that's an interesting point. It certainly reduces the... Uh, it means you've got a lot more flexibility. Mm. Okay. Now, now, as it is, one of the interesting challenges we have, and this will get stronger with time as we decarbonize heating, one of the challenges we have is that there is some... Well, there is quite a significant... There's very little difference at the moment in terms of electrical load between summer and winter. In the future, there will be much more of one because decarbonisation, whatever form it takes, Colin, before we <laughs> uh, will have to be more electrified in one way or another. Mm. 
So we will start. Now, at the moment, the seasonality for the UK, and I assume it must be even worse for Canada, the seasonality in the heating load is huge. Yeah, we're, we're, we're right now we're, we're trying to um, make sure that the, the can-do pickering is refurbished rather than uh, decommissioned. And um, yeah. so, uh, and then if they don't do that, they're going to have to rely on natural gas. And uh, yep. so natural gas is still seen by many grid operators as the solution. And uh, I, I imagine it's not as readily available in the UK. Uh, well, it's actually, yeah, it's actually slightly different. Well, our biggest use of natural gas isn't in power generation, although we do use a lot of it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Something over eight, something between 80 and 90% of us heat our homes with natural gas. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, yeah. And we effectively have no load. We have no heating, virtually no heating requirement in the summer. I've turned our heating off here already, and yeah, okay, my father-in-law's bitching at me, but that's... Ah, <laughs> oh, bloody cold. <laughs> that's good for you. Um, yeah, right. Um, but... We can hit 100 gigawatt hours, well, I think we can hit 150 gigawatt hours a day on a very cold day, sort of minus five in winter, which we don't get many of, mm. but that's a hell of a load. Mm. Has anyone done a study on what it would cost to replace all the natural gas that heats the homes with, with uh, say, uh, electric heating? Cost, no, but certain people have done an, certain people have done an analysis on these loads. I'll I'll send you a link later, Rick. Okay. Mm. Uh, a, friend, it's a huge a friend and I, yeah. yeah. What watch watch Colin's face when I say this. A friend and I did some modelling. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. 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 But, uh, yeah, yes, well, sir. It, it, it has to be heat pumps. Would you would you go with that, Andy? It just has to be heat pumps when we get rid I, of that. Heat. I think I can't see what else it can no, be. No, it can't be. Uh, but what we will have is for those extreme days, we'll have a lot of direct electrification and hope. Mm, yeah. I put, a wood, I, I put a wood burner in next last year. You can you can you can judge where my confidence lies. Anti, anti, yeah, yeah. Anti-socialist. <laughs> and I, we sh I, I think uh, you raised, uh, like I noticed you um, saw the questions and made a few notes. Uh, the questions um, about the, the uh, origin of the design of the BWRX, it came from what you called an ESBWR. And, yeah. uh, and those are yeah, all... Yeah, it, 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 X in the BWRX stands for 10th generation BWR. Oh, okay, yeah. And but ESBWR is conceptually almost identical, just five times the size. And and that's one of the huge advantages is that it's already regulated. It's already accepted in it by regulation. Uh, yeah, never built, though, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, they had but, a customer, and, and they cancelled, and they've never had any interest shown in that ESBWR since then. It's no, that will be interesting, I think, Colin, if BWRX does show that it can be generated quickly. I wonder if that might revive e ESBWR. Well, it won't because there isn't a single advantage that a big nuclear power plant has over a small modular reactor. Not one single uh, well, advantage. Well, that, that'll, depend, that'll depend on what it comes out in terms of cost per kilowatt hour. But we'll, kilowatt, but we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yes. Well, so, I, no, have, so yeah. I have great confidence that uh, the GE Itachi people, with their decades of experience... In, uh, in the boiling water reactors will be coming up with a, an overnight capital cost figure that they're prepared to publicise that will be pretty yeah, damned accurate. I mean, it's, it's, something, it's something worth mentioning for Rick, though. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that has been quite remarkable to my mind about ESBWR is where the cost savings have come from. Mm. Now, a lot of them, Colin's absolutely right, are about things like the passivation, passivization of the safety system and so on. But actually, the biggest cost saving isn't around any of the mechanical or nuclear systems whatsoever. It's on the civil side of the construction. Mm. And they've pulled together some quite remarkable ideas on that. So when you... Nowadays you are required to build an external shield around your containment to resist an aircraft impact. 
you know, I'm not saying there couldn't have been a little impact, a little event that influenced that a few years back. Yeah. But, mm. Yeah. Mm. You build them underground. Um, <laughs> precisely. So what have GE just identified they can do? They can t take a tunnel boring machine, the sort of thing that we've been using over here for extending the tube. Yeah. Turn it on its end, or turn a version of it on its end, it's not quite the same thing. Yeah. Use that to build a, effectively a downward pointing tunnel. And then as that drops, they've come up with a tech, they've identified a technique of making uh, concrete structures instead of, instead of building pre-stressed or reinforced concrete structures, which is always slow because of the curing time. And it, it means massive amounts of manual work, fixing the rebar together and so on. Yeah. When I was a very junior engineer on Hesham, I used to have the job of going around and clearing out uh, the space and the, the next volume we were going to pour um, concrete on the pressure vessel. Mm. And it was a horrible job. I'm the wrong size for that. Yeah. Um, now, the idea is you have a double wall steel shell, CNC machined, CNC wet, CNC folded and welded off site. And effectively, you can drop a meter at a time weld another ring of this double wall seal steel structure, keep dropping it until you've got your total undergrounded part finished. Then the concrete is poured, possibly even in a single pour, mm -hmm. fill the void between the two steel levels, the two, two, two steel walls. You'll grout around it on the outside and you have got not just a shield wall against aircraft impact, you've effectively got a second containment mm. because it's pressure bearing. Right, right. Mm. So, so you, you've... In the, the more I think about this, Colin, I'm wondering why they need a containment. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I, I think the containment itself is, might be helpful in the, in the uh, build of the, of the reactor. That's, all the, all that's the, uh, always possible, yeah. 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 Uh, I think it's, probably uh, not, every, not every land... Um, formation allows for solid ground. Um, so maybe they want it to be flexible um, awesome. to match. No, I, don't, I don't think they're proposing to do anything other than this vertical boring approach for the reactor. What the they reactor say, volume anyway. Yeah, what they say is that uh, the, uh, the build program can vary between two to three years, depending on site conditions. Which I do which imagine fair, has a yeah. lot, lot to do with the with the shaft boring arrangement, if you like. <clears throat> Depending so on. Oh, it would do. The, the, the deepest part will almost invariably determine that progress. Mm. So that that yeah. changes the definition of modularity. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, um, it's modular in, to a point. Uh, so where does it? Well, effectively, well. Uh, the reactor system itself is entirely modular. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's fair. Um, uh, the question is about the civil structures, but I suspect very strongly this civil structure will be, I doubt, I'll be amazed, assuming BWRX does get built in volume, I'd be amazed if there's a variation in more than 10% at the most mm. in terms of that structure. Yeah. I would agree with that, yeah. And then the other aspect, of the, the other safety aspect, is the fact that these small modular reactors do, do not have any any huge penetrations of the pressure vessels as you do on big reactors with. Hey, BWR, fantastic idea! Yeah. No pre no pipes carrying high pressure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the size of the penetrations on the small modular reactors. Um, I mean, that yeah. implies that you're not going to have. They, they, they talk about. Um, these uh, large, you know, the local accidents, loss of coolant accidents, um, almost yeah. a thing of the past when you haven't got um, any large penetrations into the into the pressure vessels. <clears throat> Speaking of someone, Colin, who once got a bucket of urine dumped over his head <laughs> for condemning a weld oh. on a, uh, on a <laughs> con condemning a weld on a penetration on his. <laughs> And the, um, the, the the group of welders who's who were on piecework. <laughs> I don't know what that doesn't. I don't know if that translates to your side of the Atlantic. The welders were paid per inch. Yeah, yeah. And I made them grind out twelve inches Ooh. and start again, which yeah. was about three days' work. Yeah, 
Um, <laughs> funnily enough, on the night shift shortly afterwards, I suddenly felt something very smelly poured over my head from two layers of scaffolding <laughs> up. <laughs> Horrible. <laughs> but, uh, yes, mate, it's me, Collins evening, though. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've never quite upset anybody that much, Andy. <laughs> um, so there's Welcome a, to my life. How, I have a question about the temperature. How hot do they get, the BWRX uh, 300? 300 degrees, typical BW, BWR temperatures, mm. which is not brilliant from an efficiency perspective. No. But if they're cheap, who cares? Mm, exactly. right. Liberty shit. Mm. So, um, okay, so... So in terms of uh, a reactor being considered a hybrid reactor for two purposes, d does it seem impractical to use a BWRX 300? Uh, okay. Now, again, we'll get into this. Colin would argue using the electrical output to make hydrogen make some hybrid. In terms of direct usage of heat, probably not. You can't do much about, say, steel making. Right. Not 300 degrees. Uh, you, you need, you you need can, five, six, seven hundred degrees. So there's degrees different applications, to be, sure. Yeah, um, district heating, maybe, right? No, let me, yeah, let, me just, anyway, let, me just, and, let me just pursue that because New, yeah. New Scale have come up with this study that they can um, use the thermal capacity of the reactor um, and just use two and a half percent of the electrical output and raise the, um, the primary steam, if you like, up to 850 degrees centigrade. Now, that yeah. almost obviates any need for high-temperature reactors, if you can do it with... Which, a... I, which I'm highly suspicious of, because what they're effectively doing is using very high-temperature heat pumps to increase the temperature, but they're going to have to dump a massive amount of heat in order to do so. I would have thought it's just resistance heating of some kind, Andy. So they take. The, oh, I suppose, I, I suppose it could the, be. Uh, but I don't know what their the temp, their output temperature will be as a. I mean, it's a conventional it's PWR. PWR three fifty. Three fifty. And they take it up to eight fifty C, using just two and a half percent of the electrical output. Oh, I, so, I must have a look at that. But yeah. those numbers don't work for well, me. It, it, they put it through. Or, or there's a very small quantity of very hot steam. Well, um, what, what it does is it, it improves the hydrogen manufacturing capacity by 50%. So um, you can actually get... Yeah, it's, it's how much heat gets thrown away in the process, though, Colin. We'd have to see. The, the we have that... Um... There's no heat thrown away. It's, um, it's fed into a, a, a solid... I think they call them solid oxide uh, electrolyzers, high-temperature steam electrolysis. Okay. Yeah. Well, I know, again, we... I know that, um, that that there's been some discussion about why would you introduce something complicated when you're trying to get your reactor accepted as a, such as such as a hybrid reactor, and I understand that thinking. I'm sure you guys do too, but I I, I noticed that Colin um, posted something recently about this Canadian. Actually, uh, his name is Paul Martin, and he was posting stuff about hydrogen, how we underestimate its damage that it can do if it leaks into the atmosphere. And um, and that's another factor we have to consider, whether we think of the hydrogen economy, if we can even use that word anymore, because um, it's, uh, is it going to be distributable uh, without consequences? I'll, I'll hold up my hands on that. I have no idea what yeah. beyond well, that. I think, I, I think, I think that's just pure speculation. It never, yeah. came, it never came back to me. Um, you know, I, I sort of attacked him directly, if you like. On uh, I, I was trying to, I was trying to enlist uh, uh, an American um, chemist, um, Stephen Boyd. You might have heard of him, uh, yeah. and he's uh, he's pursuing finding uh, sin fuels and e fuels, as they call them, um, oh. and um, and a lot of people see those as uh, difficult. Um, but not impossible. So this uh, Stephen Boyd is quite a genius, and he's come up with all kinds of um, possible scenarios where you could see it happen. So he's actually been hired to do that. Uh, he's working on for some company to 
to come up with solutions to creating uh, e-fuels. E um, if you've got a uh, link to the gentleman, I'd like to see that. Uh, can you, guys, can you excuse me for about 30 seconds? Yeah. I've just got low battery coming up. I'll be back as soon as I've got my power okay. supply. Okay, good. Yeah, we can edit this stuff. Um, not a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you've got a link to the gentleman, anything he's doing, I'd, uh, I'd like to know that because... Uh, oh, yeah. Stephen like Boyd, um, Dr. Stephen Boyd, I think it is. And uh, um, he has some fascinating uh, things that he's talked about over the years. One of them was turning ordinary sand into fuel. And uh, so silicon-based power, which would be useful on somewhere like Mars or whatever, you know, Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, so he's got some interesting <laughs> angles and topics that he's, mm. he's pursued. Uh, we've, we've interviewed him. I, when I was with the, uh, Eco Modernist podcast, um, we interviewed him along with Ed File and a few others. Uh, um, yeah, we had Steve, uh, uh, Steinhaus and, um, forgotten his first name, um, and uh, also Robert, Robert Steinhaus, was it? That's right, Robert, Robert Steinhaus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he's great. He's got a thorough knowledge of um, fusion, and uh, yeah, and um, so I'd be curious about what kind of power problem he just had because um, it's not related to the grid. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. Well. Well, uh, Andy, the battery charger. Oh. <laughs> See, energy storage. It's always energy storage that knackers all these good ideas. It wasn't stage, was it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, that's good. Very good. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so, so that was interesting. You know, the idea that uh, we still have these certain advantages of certain kinds of reactors that lend themselves towards... Um, hybrid solutions or temp high temperature industrial heat. And I, I guess there's always the question is the arc furnace, is that um, too costly? Uh, having something where you produce heat deliberately with electricity? Mm, depends on the price of the electricity. Um, the interesting thing on those is inevitably we're gonna shift more and more, you know, taking steel as an example, we're going to shift more and more to recycling-based processes. Um, arc furnaces are what you use for recycling steel mm. rather than smelt from scratch. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of new steel, I, I, I understand Bill Gates is putting money into a, an electrolysis process and there's nothing chemically that would stop you using electrolysis to smelt steel from ore or smelt iron from ore. Well, it's, um, it's going big. I mean, you've got the um, you've got the big um, German manufacturers. I mean, Germany are going to have to adopt a hydrogen economy, whether anybody else likes it or not, because it's the only way they can get round intermittency in a in a net zero world. There's nothing else. Can we can we not can we not discuss German energy policy in a reasonably <laughs> sane conversation? <laughs> yeah. Well, what's going to happen that's so intriguing? I mean, within five years, they've actually got to U-turn or go down the drain, haven't they? One or the other. Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm... I'm quite convinced that'll involve people dangling from things, but... <laughs> yeah, we haven't actually mentioned Russia in this conversation. That's um, pretty let's, interesting. Let's not. <laughs> um, uh, okay, um... So getting back to some of those questions, I just didn't get through them all, but I don't plan to, to ask them now because I kind of covered. But um, uh, the idea of um, the waste burner, uh, can, a wa can a BWRX 300 be a waste burner? No, it's not as it's built at the moment. What would it but... need? What would it need to change? Um, well, this was an idea that Toshiba, who were also a GE licensee alongside Hitachi, came up with 10, 15 years ago, and some Japanese academics. Effectively, you change the design of the, the, the react, 90% stays the same. You reduce the, you reduce the spacing between fuel rods in the core. 
So something called the mean free path, the path that the neutron flies before it, you know, having been created at a fission, it'll bounce around, go through the moderation process mm -hmm. before it impinges on another uranium atom and fissions. Now, if you reduce the spacing and the amount of water and steam in the core by packing it more closely, what that means is your neutron has gone under, undergone less moderation by the time it, it goes into the new collision. So it has what it has what it, it's what's called epithermal. So it carries more energy than a thermal neutron. Nowhere near as much as a fast neutron. But in fact, you don't need to go all the way up to fast spectrum in order to burn th things like americium, plutonium-240, curium, neptunium, and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, the viability of reprocessing is very largely determined by how much of those you've got. Yeah. And in particular, what, what you can't do is undergo multiple cycles of reprocessing fuel because in a normal thermal reactor cycle, these things build up and make it almost impossible to handle. They're also one of the main, and again, probably a word that I don't think this word will translate into Canadian anyway, one of the main buggerations for fuel disposal. Yeah is these things are a na have a nasty combination of a reason. Tens of thousand year half-lives. So they're hot-ish. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah, sure. Which means they also hang around compared to the fission products and so on, which are gone in a couple of hundred years. Mm -hmm. So actually, not having those in spent fuel not only makes design of things like um, spent fuel repositories much easier... It also um, makes reprocessing easier. It means effectively you... I don't know whether you could run one as a waste burner. I see no reason why not. But certainly your spent fuel coming out of a reduced moderation BWR of some sort is much more benign. Okay. Now, that was just proposed for a BWR. Mm -hmm. I see no logical reason at all why the same mechanism couldn't be applied to BWRX. Mm. That's good. And, and uh, so I guess a lot depends on who's separating the fission products, how they're preparing them for, the, um, for, the, for each uh, reactor to use, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, or alternatively, you don't, you know, if you don't decide to go down the reprocessing route, mm -hmm. If, you know, if seawater extraction of uranium becomes as viable as it might, and if deep borehole disposal turns out to be as cheap as it should, you can still run a once-through once fuel cycle, but you just, well, you don't even need deep borehole, uh, deep borehole disposal. You've got a very benign spent fuel. Well, very well, is a relative term. Yeah. yeah. No, that's fascinating stuff. Well, I'm, I I'm more than happy with the, with the existing fuel cycle right through to end of life and disposition. I can't see... So, so, so is anyone in their right mind? So. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it's the, the whole raison d'etre for uh, Gen 4 reactors, isn't it, to get to the, to get to the breeder reactor stage and uh, waste burning. But, and um, like I say, if if seawater extraction with four billion tons to go at does turn to be well, that's it. Even marginally viable, that's generation four screwed. There you go. <laughs> uh, yep, uh, that, that, that's my feeling entirely, Andy. I've thought that for a while now, and um, and I think I look, looked up how long the Earth would remain inhabitable, and I think it's only a million years. I know it's like. Um, it's like five billion. Yeah. Five, no, uh, we have billion, fuel for considerably billion, longer. Yeah, not five, but yeah. not five billion until we go into yeah. the red but then, it, but then again, But then again, Rick, once again, having made that argument, my own life expectancy may be reduced if Ed File finds me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's good. I like it. So, um, all right. Now, um, a lot of this will go over the heads of some of our watchers, but that's Okay. Now, uh, I guess we're coming to a close. I just thought I'd give you both a chance to say um, any wrap-up comments that you might have um, that you wanted to convey before we stop. Yeah. Oops. 
Uh, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I don't know how the hell I've managed that. Let me look. What's that? I, was I noticed just, your lighting. Yeah, your lighting is not the greatest. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm just being lit by the uh, by the uh, light from the <laughs> from a <the> little laptop. <laughs> that's because. Of, is it because it's night time? It is, yeah, yeah. Yes, it is night time here. I, oh, I get it. I didn't it's want the first eight. I thought we would be wrapping up pretty soon, and I didn't. We want started to get off up. in daylight. I think is that what happened? I, yeah, I didn't want to get up and put the light on. <laughs> yeah. yet, yet again, the story of my life: the gradual descent into darkness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just putting okay. up. A, I'm just putting up a link to my um, Substack because I want the. Uh, oh yeah, good share that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, it, I, and if you, how, to, I, how, to, how to cease burning fossil fuels within a few decades? You heard it here first. I, <laughs> I've got a link here. If I can do it, yeah, and I will definitely uh, be able to add, um, you know, on the screen for people to see these, and like I can edit. Uh, I'm planning to edit these uh, channels that we have. They're actually separate tracks. Yeah. So, um, and if we do have pictures of the BWRX to to consider, I will post up those as well. If any of you have um, any materials you can share with me, that'd be great. I could just uh, add that to our, uh, for our viewers. And can I, um, can that be added afterwards? Can I send Absolutely. you? Absolutely, I'm going to do that. All oh, right. I, I, I'm planning to keep in touch with you guys to make sure we don't leave anything out that's going to be useful for people. Yeah, well... I don't think we've done brilliantly because uh, we've been too busy chuckling away, haven't we? But uh, people might get a little bit of uh, good information out of it. All. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, we had we covered some good ground um, mm. and uh, and the workings of the UK. <laughs> um, very good. OK, uh, so thanks very much, guys. Uh, was there, did, did I leave out anything? Did you leave out anything? Well, you, you, you'd only asked about where uh, people should train to become a nuclear engineer, but I can understand why you're not ro you're not broadcasting that. <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. I left that question out. Yeah, let's put that in. Let's, let's give it. <laughs> well, as, as you know, you'd listed Rensselaer, you'd listed University of Pittsburgh. I replied on behalf of the UK, and I quote, Cambridge and a couple of others, but in particular the nuclear unit at Manchester University, which is now called the Dalton Institute. Yeah. I should also add, it produces graduates of particular intelligence, wit, charm, sophistication, and sexual prowess. <laughs> Guess where I went to college. It, it, it has more significance when I hear you say it. I saw those words. That, <laughs> but, um, yeah, um, so, uh, and you are, are you currently a professor? Me? Yeah. No. No? Okay. And uh, Never? Never. Oh, okay. I, I, I did a postgraduate. Well, I started a PhD and bailed out when I got a better job offer, but that's a long time ago. <laughs> okay. You do a load of teaching, though, don't you, Andy? You do plenty I of know, I'm now re semi-retired, and I make a living um, teaching physics and science to actually not even now, Colin, to A-level students. All my students at the moment are people who've got educational difficulties. All right. Oh. <laughs> that was yeah. useful. Mm. Uh, hmm. I mean, no, I mean, it's great that you have taken that direction. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm uh, like, I uh, just wanted to finish up saying I'm a musician who is fascinated about the need for solving our, uh, our energy problems. I ended up creating the website called energyrealityproject.com. And that oh, that's easy, is it? Yeah, oh, right. and, and that was a uh, kind of a bit of sarcasm because there was this climate reality project that was brought up by uh, Al Gore, and I didn't like the way he was taking things, so I kind of was reacting to him when, by calling it a very similar name. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but I, yeah, so, so we have, um, yeah, we, we have some, a lot of common uh, ground that we've all uh, faced and, um, and we're all fighting for, so that's great. So I appreciate your comments and your help today. And uh, I'm going to wrap up and, and say, let's try this again sometime. And uh, yeah, I'm... <laughs> okay, very definitely. That was good fun. Okay, great. Yeah, Thanks a lot. Not that, that wasn't your intent, but we got good fun out of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, Thank you. All right. Okay. Goodbye, guys. Okay. Bye. Okay.